After watching this video, you should be able to describe glycolysis starting from glucose, going all the way to 2-pyruvate, pointing out specifically the important steps that are irreversible, that um, use ATP or produce ATP, or interconvert NADH and NAD+. You should also be able to um, describe what happens under aerobic and anaerobic conditions and a little bit about regulation. So let's start with the big picture and that is uh, glycolysis occurs in all cells. Um, virtually all the cells in the body have the ability to take up glucose and that glucose when it's taken into the cell um, it goes through the process of glycolysis which is, is, is 10 steps ultimately produces 2-pyruvate and depending on if you have mitochondria, if there's oxygen present, this pyruvate then can go off and do some different things that we'll talk about later. Um, and in terms of energy yield, um, it's important to point out that um, you, you invest two ATPs into the system through these 10 steps, and you actually get four ATP out. So there's a net um, yield of, of two ATP, and that, that may be more um, if there's oxygen and there's mitochondria present, um, and, and there's the ability to um, undergo TCA cycle and electron transport chain. Now, as far as regulation goes, um, we like to focus on the liver. Um, it's a good example of the regulation. And if you recall, when there's fasting and there's a low plasma glucose, glucagon is high, insulin is low, the combination of this hormonal profile suppresses glycolysis in the liver. Okay, and when you're in the well-fed state, you're going to get the opposite. You're going to get an increase in plasma glucose, an increase in insulin, suppression of glucagon, and then that combination uh, is going to give you an increase in glycolysis. And you might remember from a previous video that looks something like this. Okay, so here we are fasting, okay, and we need to be having pyruvate go all the way to glucose so it goes out of the cell, so we don't want this glucose going and that we work very hard to make and remember it costs uh, um, uh, ATP to run gluconeogenesis and we remember we get that ATP from fatty acid oxidation um, and um, and the acetyl-CoA going into the TCA cycle and we wouldn't want that glucose to go back down glycolysis when it needs to go out of the cell so it makes sense that glycolysis would be turned off um, in the liver in fasting uh, conditions okay if we have the well-fed state we want glucose to be taken up by the liver we want that glucose 6-phosphate to go to glycogen pentose phosphate shunt and and go to 2-pyruvate so we can make acetyl-CoA to make fatty acids and cholesterol and also go to TCA and make ATP so we want glycolysis turned on right um, at the same time gluconeogenesis would be turned off so here's the big picture Right, glycolysis is, is really happening over here in the liver in the well-fed state where we have our glucose, those 10 steps, going all the way to 2-pyruvate. So hopefully this, this um, is a review of what happens in the liver and um, fasting and well-fed state and shows you visually why we want that glucose to be going down glycolysis when we have lots of sugar around. Okay, so that's the, that's the overall, uh, overall picture for um, what we're going to be uh, focusing on, right? All cells, 10 steps, and some regulation. And now we want to take our attention to um, uh, another summary that we did in the previous video, where again we show um, insulin and glucagon having their effects on glycolysis. So if we go and focus in over here on glycolysis, we see gl glucagon inhibits glycolysis and insulin stimulates glycolysis, right? Because remember, all these get turned on together. And in another video, we're going to go into detail of how this regulation actually occurs, okay? But what we're focusing on in this video is just glycolysis, all right? Now, we go and look at a zoomed-in version of glycolysis. This is a little bit simplified. It doesn't have all the details that you might find in like a biochemistry text. But I think it, it does a pretty good job of highlighting the important stuff that you need to get out of this. All right, so if we think about, um, if we think about the well-fed state, and here we have the liver, okay, and we have glucose is going to be taken up through the glucose transporter 2 that's constitutively present. Now we got glucose in the liver. 
Okay, and the first step of glycolysis, and, I, and I've indicated that with a one here, is uh, the phosphorylation of glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate. Now I have glucokinase written here because this is a special form um, that's found in the liver as well as the beta cell um, of hexokinase. So hexokinase and glucokinase are really going to do the same thing. I just put glucokinase here just because it's a special one that's also found in the liver and beta cell. In this case we're just focusing on the liver. And um, what we're going to get is a trapping of this hexose sugar inside the cell. Remember, phosphorylation of, of this molecule is going to prevent it from uh, leaving the cell, right? So now it's committed to um, doing some different things inside this liver cell. Now, we just have glycolysis shown here, but I want to remind you that glucose 6-phosphate under these conditions um, can go off to make glycogen, right? And also can undergo the pentose phosphate shunt to make NADPH, which you recall you need to, um, to make fatty acids and cholesterol. Okay? Now, um, this glucose 6-phosphate is now um, formed again by this irreversible step. You see how this arrow is not a double-headed arrow, right? It's a, it, it's a one direction, and that tells us that it's an irreversible step. And you can see here this next step this is indicating that this is a reversible step. And I'm not even going to write the, um, the name of the enzyme because it's reversible. It's not regulated in any special way. There's nothing really special going on about it. If you really want to know the name, it's phosphoglucose isomerase because it's just going to um, uh, create an isomer, right? It's going to make a glucose 6-phosphate simply to fructose 6-phosphate. Okay, so that's an isomerization. Now, now we have the fructose 6-phosphate. Now we have another irreversible step. I've numbered it now as step three. And the PFK1 stands for phosphofructokinase 1. Okay, and so what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to phosphorylate this, this already phosphorylated sugar and make a doubly phosphorylated molecule, right? It's going to have now phosphates at the 1 and 6 position. Now the way I remember this is this name makes a lot of sense. It's a phosphofructokinase, so it's phosphorylating a phosphorylated fructose. And this one helps me remember that it's going to put that phosphate in the one position. It's going to form a F16-bisphosphate. The reason why I'm pointing that out is that in another video when we talk about some of the regulation, there's a PFK2 that's not part of glycolysis that forms a fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So the way I, I remember which one goes where is that the 1 goes along with the 1, 6. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. And you can see here we have the ATP input, and there's the two ATPs that we discussed earlier that's invested into this process. Okay, so so far we put in two ATPs. And now we're at the, the F1, 6 bisphosphate stage. Now what's going to happen is we're going to have an aldolase that's going to cleave this, uh, this molecule into two uh, trioses, a dihydroxyacetone phosphate and a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule. Now you can see the way this is drawn, that it's really the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate that has the capability to go and finish off this glycolysis pathway. So what happens is this DHAP molecule, the way the equilibrium is, is, is that it kind of comes over here there's actually a triose phosphate isomerase enzyme that does that. It's another uh, step of glycolysis. And, um, and you make ultimately two of these molecules, these two of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules. All right. Now, um, even though this is a reversible step, I'm putting in this enzyme, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, because some special stuff happens here. Um, OK? so. Um, as you can see, we have um, some stuff going on with NADH and NAD+, and, and really this is the first um, oxidation reduction reaction of glycolysis. So um, we have NAD+, here, we have two of them, okay, and, and these are oxidized, and they're going to become reduced to NADH as we further oxidize this molecule and form 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, okay, and we, again, we have two of these you know, because when we cleave this, 
with the aldolase and these trioses, we had now everything's multiplied by two. Okay, so that's why you see this two here again. Okay, and um, the other thing is that we use an inorganic phosphate to now get another phosphate on this molecule. So now, now we have phosphates at the one and three position. All right. Um, now what happens next is that there's going to be uh, um, a production of ATP. All right. And it's going to be multiplied by two here again because everything it, we have two of everything. And the and the interesting thing here is that this enzyme, okay, is a kinase. All right, it's called phosphoglycerol uh, kinase. All right, and it's abbreviated PGK. Um, and we think of kinases as uh, phosphorylating things, but in this case. It's a, reversible, uh, it's a reversible step. So when we're doing glycolysis, we're actually making ATP. Um, an interesting thing is when we do gluconeogenesis, since it's a reversible reaction, it's actually going to go the other way and we're actually going to use ATP. But when we're going in this direction in glycolysis, this is a step where we make now ATP and now we're making two ATP. So now, we've, now, we're, now we're even. You know, we put in two ATPs in step one and step three. Now in step seven, now we make two, so now, so now we, we kind of are, are um, net zero ATPs, and we're going to see when we finally finish this thing off, we're going to squeeze out a couple of more ATP, and we're going to end up with a net two production. Okay. Now, um, this, this three phosphoglycerate molecule um, is going to undergo an, a reversible reaction. Okay, this is a mutase, a phosphoglycerate mutase. And then we have a dehydration step. Um, this is called um, uh, PEP, phosphoenolpyruvate. This is an enolase, okay, another step that's reversible that we don't really need to worry about. Nothing terribly exciting except we're pulling off water. And now this PEP is going to be converted to pyruvate through pyruvate kinase. And now we're going to get more ATP. And again, it's the same kind of weird thing. We have a kinase. Right, but in the way the, the, the reactions are, are set up, this is an irreversible step where we're actually producing ATP rather than, than using it to phosphorylate something. So we have um, two kinases here. One of them is reversible, the PGK, but this one here is irreversible. It's the third irreversible step of glycolysis where we now finally have a net production of ATP. The net production is two. Okay, so. When we first started off saying we have glucose going all the way to 2 pyruvate, it was 10 steps. Now we see the endpoint, the 2 pyruvate molecules. All right. So to summarize this, these three molecules are the three irreversible steps of glycolysis. Step one, glucokinase forming glucose 6-phosphate. Step three, phosphofructokinase 1 forming F16-bisphosphate. And step 10, PEP going to pyruvate with pyruvate kinase, okay? And then we also pointed out that there are some other steps that are not irreversible but have some importance. We have the glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase step, which um, takes the NAD plus to NADH, and we have the reversible PGK where, where we make ATP, okay? Now, um, it's very important to, to think about this step six here, okay? And the reason why is that NAD plus is very limited in the cell, all right? And you can see that when NAD plus gets converted to NADH, if we don't have a mechanism to get that NAD plus regenerated, very soon this whole glycolytic pathway is going to be shut down, right? Because if step six doesn't work, then this thing's not going not gonna to go forward. So we need to discuss, and it's very important, the way that we get NAD plus back. Okay, and that really depends on whether or not we have oxygen present or not, or, or, or we have a mitochondria or not, which is really the same kind of idea. So what we're going to talk about now is the regeneration of NAD plus for that step six, that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase step. Now, um, under anaerobic conditions, or if you don't have mitochondria, and pathophysiologically, if there's, if there's decreased blood flow to, to cells and the blood carries oxygen, so there's less oxygen, we um, use a step 
that um, produces lactate. Okay, and the enzyme that does this is lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH. And you can see here what we do is we take the NADH that we made inside the cell and it gets reconverted back to NAD+. Okay, so we're taking this reduced NADH, we're oxidizing it, and we're taking this oxidized pyruvate and we're reducing it. And that's a very important way that we can keep glycolysis going. All right, and, um, and you can see that what we've done here is we've, we've linked step six and this LDH that way. So you can see how it kind of goes around like a little cycle. Okay? And, and I, and I want to point out again that, that cells that lack mitochondria, like for example red blood cells, this is the only thing that they can do. Right? So they only can make lactate. And, um, and it is important clinically to think about when you have someone who has decreased oxygenation of the blood or decreased blood flow to tissues, that this gets turned on more and we end up producing more lactate from those cells, which, which has some pathophysiological importance that we'll discuss in another video. Now, under aerobic conditions where we have oxygen and of course mitochondria, the pyruvate actually gets transported into the mitochondria and it gets converted to acetyl-CoA. And the enzyme that does is a very complex enzyme, it's called pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is another oxidation reduction reaction. We, we, actually, we actually make more NADH, which is important because this ultimately will go to the, go to the electron transport chain. Okay? And the acetyl-CoA goes into the TCA cycle. We make lots of NADH. We also make some uh, FADH2, another electron carrier. And then the NADH ultimately um, goes to NAD+, through the, the uh, electron transport chain. And so that's how we regenerate the NAD+, under aerobic conditions. Okay, so it's a very different situation okay, than, than under anaerobic conditions. But the, the net effect though is that we're getting that NAD plus back so we can keep step six going. Um, and there are some other, uh, besides this mechanism here of pyruvate going to make acetyl-CoA, there are some other shuttles that exist that um, are, are, are um, another way of regenerating NAD plus that we're not gonna go into detail. Okay, I, want to, I think um, you, may, you may come across the glycerol phosphate shuttle, for example. Okay, it's just another way of getting NAD plus back. All right, so that, that's the, um, how you get the NAD plus back. Okay, so to go back to where we started from, recall that glycolysis is occurring in all cells, all right, regardless if they have mitochondria or not. There's 10 steps, but you want to focus on the irreversible ones, step 1, 3, and 10. You want to focus also on the steps that uh, use or, or con, uh, produce ATP and um, have um, uh, NAD plus to NADH conversions. You want to think about the regulation under fasting and well-fed state with glucagon and insulin. And you want to think about the mechanisms to regenerate NAD plus using lactate dehydrogenase or um, pyruvate dehydrogenase, TCA cycle, and electron transport chain if there's oxygen in the mitochondria. And that concludes this video on glycolysis.